Discord. There we go. Okay, so tonight's class um, is a little about a little bit of an esoteric subject. Um, let me preface it by saying that we all know that there are generally 12 months of the year. And why I say generally, because in the Hebrew calendar, um, there are, in fact, sometimes 13 months in the year. As we've explained before, in order to bring the lunar cycle in sync with the solar cycle, we have a video on that. If you want to catch up on it on, uh, on YouTube, you can have a look in our channel, <coughs> uh, Sinking the Sun and the Moon. However, in a leap year, in a Jewish leap year, there are 13 months. Now, why is this important? Uh, it is important to know because all of the months have a particular character. Every month has its particular um, quality and is associated with a particular tribe and is associated with a particular sense in Kabbalah, in Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, very ancient book uh, that was written down by the famous sage Rabbi Akiva that was in like the first, second century, or common era, um, but it was actually uh, only written down by him. The actual teachings come from Abraham. They were passed down orally until he wrote them down. And uh, in this book, the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, um, it explains that the twelve months uh, the uh, that there are twelve chushim, there are twelve senses. We only normally talk about five of them. Um, yeah, yeah, in other words, uh, seeing, hearing, feeling, you know, touching, tasting, smelling. Those are the five senses. But in Kabbalah, there are many, many more than that. There's a sense of speech. There's a sense of, um, it's called Iyun. Iyun means the ability to delve into something in depth. There's a sense of movement. Um, in some other ancient cultures as well, for instance, in uh, American Indian culture, there is also a, uh, from what I understand, there is also a... Um, a, a, a sense of, they also talk about a sense of, uh, of movement, a sense of movement and, uh, which is associated with a sense of balance. A sense of balance, as far as we're concerned, which is the next one, is associated really with hearing. As we all know, when a person has um, um, problems with their ears, um, so their balance is thrown off, as we all know. So we count balance under hearing as well. Then there's a, a, a hush, a, um, a sense of action. There's a sense of touch, as we know. There's a sense of smell. There's a sense of sleep. Uh, a sense of anger, a sense of eating. And this month's sense is, of course, the sense of laughter. Laughter is also one of the senses. So there's a sense of laughter. And this month's sense is the sense of laughter, and we'll perhaps explain why that is important and what that actually comes to, um, to, to, to teach us. What the sense of laughter means as a sense. What does it do? Is it simply a, um, uh, a recognition of a situation which is humorous and therefore a person laughs, or is it a causative factor in other things? We'll talk about that possibly a little bit later. But just as there are 12 senses, there are also 12 characteristics to every month, and every month is associated with one of the tribes, the 12 tribes, traditionally. And the 12 tribes are each associated with one, one of the months. I don't want to go into it now because it's really not that relevant. But what is relevant is that there is a permutation, the Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, in explaining the Sefer Yitzira, he explains that each month has a tziruf, a tziruf or a tziruf, which means a permutation of one of the divine names. We've spoken about uh, divine names on several occasions, 
Um, and just to explain very briefly, a divine name is can be understood according to the question that uh, that Moses, that Moshe Rabbeinu Moses asked of God when he was being sent to redeem, to take out the Jewish people from the land of Egypt, the Israelites from the land of Egypt. <coughs> so um, Moses was rather concerned because he would have to go to the elders and explain to them that he'd been given this mission. And with what authority did he come to this mission? So he asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God said, my name you wish to know. He replied, my name you wish to know. According to my deeds, I am called. So each of the names of God is therefore representative of a certain quality of deed. It's a certain quality of deed. Now, the, um, the deed that is associated with, um, with creation, for instance, is the name, I'm sorry, the name that is associated with creation is the name Elohim. Elohim. E-L-O-K-I-M, or if you're writing it in Hebrew, it would be Aleph, Lamed, Kuf, Yud, Mem, Elohim. It's really spelled with a He, not a Kuf, but that's the way we say it. Elohim, because otherwise you only use it in prayer, otherwise, or in meditation, but not, you don't say the name really as it is. But, that's why that's the name of uh, of that that's used throughout creation. By Yom Elokim He or God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. We translate it as God, but it's a specific form of it. It it is equivalent to the manifestation of godliness in the natural realm. That's what it is. That's what the name Elokim means. Now, there's also the name, the ineffable name, as it's called, or the transcendent name of God. In other words, the name which signifies transcendence. And that is the name Yud He Vav He, or Yud Ke Vav Ke, as it's sometimes called, or Havaya. Yud He Vav He. So, um, this this name, this transcendent name, because there are two letters which are similar. Let me just uh, write it down in the chat here, so you can see. It will be. Um, I'll do it in caps. All right, that would be the um, uh, the the English, and in Hebrew it would be Yud. That's what it would be in Hebrew. Okay, that's the transcendent, ineffable, ineffable meaning. We don't pronounce it uh, because of its holiness and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Now, because there are two similar letters in this um, in, in 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 this permutation in this name, so there's only twelve possible permutations. Um, there's only twelve as one times two times three times four, which would be twenty-four divided by two makes twelve. That's how many permutations are possible with this uh, particular with this particular name. Each of the twelve permutations is associated with a month. The month of redemption, which is the month of Nisan, which is not this coming month, which is the second Adar, but the month after that, the month of Passover, which is called the month of Nisan. The permutation is the straight permutation. In other words, the permutation that you see here without um, changing the order of the letters. When the letters are in their proper order. Now, each of these names, no, uh, so, um, in, in the 12 months of the year, Therefore, the order of the letters changes, but it's the same letters. The same letters, but in a different order, and there's 12 possible combinations. Our question, therefore, is when we come to the 13th month, which is this up to this month that is uh, coming up, it'll be uh, next week. The ne next week, the new month will, uh, will begin. Uh, the second Adar. 
So when the second arah begins, uh, what is its permutation? What is the permutation of this second adar? And there's all kinds of, uh, of explanations of it. I'm going to go with one of the explanations for now. There's other explanations, and I'm giving classes on the other explanations of it. The explanation is that it's the same as the, uh, it's the, same as the first adar. It doesn't make a difference if it's a leap year. It still keeps the same permutation, even though it's a different month, but because it has the same qualities, it's still the month of laughter, and so on and so forth, and the month that's associated with, uh, with the festival of Purim. So in a non-leap year, it is a certain permutation, which I'll get to in a minute. And in leap year, it's also a, uh, the same permutation for both months. That's one explanation. There are others. Maybe we'll get to them uh, shortly. Now, in the... Um, In the writings of the Arizal, in one of the books of the Arizal's right, the Arizal was, for those of you who are not familiar, the Arizal was the father of modern Kabbalah. When I say modern Kabbalah, he was in the 1500s. He lived in the 1500s, in the 16th century. Uh, but all of his ideas are still being developed uh, now. He was kind of a revolutionary thinker in many, many ways, a very, very uh, unusual thinker. And uh, he had this ability to, um, to understand things in a, like a multi, not only a multi-dimensional way, but in a, but in a super dimensional way. <laughs> he understood things, in other words, if we were put it in Kabbalistic terminology, we generally look at things that we see in front of us, the physical world, the world around us, and maybe we try and extract some underlying principles uh, from it in order to understand it, sort of a, a higher order thinking. An example, a simple example of a higher order thinking would be um, like a mathematical formula. I'll give you an example. Teaching a child uh, how to count, two plus two equals four. So what do you do? You take objects, simple objects, two oranges plus two oranges equals, and you count one, two, three, four, right? Two apples plus two apples, one, two, three, four. It's also four. And eventually you're going to teach him that two anything plus two anything, two X plus two X equals four X. And it doesn't matter what the objects are. So two plus two equals four. Now, if you would ask, where is this 2 plus 2 exactly? Where is it? It's, is it, if I go to the moon, is it there? If, I go, if I'm on Mars, is it there? If I'm in outer space, is it, of course it's there. Two plus, it's a formula. It's not a thing. It's not dependent on things for 2 plus 2 to equal 4 because it's a higher level of existence. It's a higher order existence or higher order thinking. Similarly, with the Arizal, not only was he able to uh, see things uh, as, the, as they are, truly are in this world, but he was able to see things as they are in their root, in their spiritual root up above, in the transcendent world, the world of Atsilut, and even beyond that. Therefore, there's a lot, obviously, of his thoughts to unpack and to understand. Now, when Arizal starts talking about this particular month, so he talks about the Tzirufim, the, um, the order of the letters of the name that we said before, of Yud Kei Vav Kei, and as he does in every case, he associates it with a verse. He associates it with a verse. What is the verse that he associates it with? Let's just uh, go to share screen and I will show you. Here we go. This is a verse, in fact, from uh, Esther, Megillat Esther, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, one, one of the books of the 24 books of the Bible, one of the 24 books of the Bible. And uh, it is based on, let me just make this a little bigger so you can see it better. Is that good? Everyone sees? Okay. Um, so. It's in Megillat Esther, chapter 5, verse 13. Esther 5, 13. 
And the verse says, V'chol zeh eneno shave li. This was the, um, the person at that time who wanted to actually destroy the Jewish people. His name was Haman, Haman. And uh, when he saw, even though he was invited to a, a feast that only he and the king would be invited to, uh, Haman was his um, chief minister, chief minister of the king. The king's name was Ahasuerus. Uh, this is in Persia. In um, uh, does anyone know the dates? Uh, it would be um, I don't know a couple of hundred years before the Common Era. In any event, uh, no more than a couple of hundred years, like four hundred. Um, 480 years before the common era, actually. Okay, so. Um, so, what he had said was this. When he was invited to this feast, he was invited to a feast with uh, the, with the emperor, Hashverosh, uh, and Haman, there were only two. And uh, he was very, very excited about this. But um, he had a nemesis, an arch nemesis, whose name was Mordechai. Mordechai was the, um, the head of the Sanhedrin, he was the head of the Jewish court, and um, he was a, um, a very lofty soul, a tzaddik, a righteous person, and a very saintly person as well. And he was the only one in all of the king's um, palace he was also an advisor to the king. He was the only one in the king's palace who would not bow to Haman. Haman had made a rule, he made a law, that everyone, just as they bowed to the emperor, they had to bow to him as well, because he was the emperor's chief representative. The only one that refused to bow to him was Mordechai. Mordechai, he wouldn't bow down to Haman. And this irked Haman no end. Um, so when he was, even though he was invited to, to the Feast of Esther, which eventually landed up as his, um, as the thing that caused his downfall, which, um, I'll explain as we go along. What did he say? He said, all of this is not, it, it means nothing to me. It means nothing to me. It's not worth anything to me. Says the Arizal, this verse here, you can see the letters that are in red spell out the name, sorry, spell out the permutation of the divine name of this month. Hey, Vav, Hey, Yud. Hey, Vav, Hey, Yud. Which is exactly the opposite of the way it really should be. The way the name should be is it should be Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. That's the way it should be. But it is exactly the opposite. It is the um, 360, 180 degrees different from from uh, from the Yudke Vavke, the, the the proper way it should be. Not only is it 180 degrees opposite of it, but it also comes out from the ending letters of the verse, rather than the earlier letters in the verse. The mirror image, that's the right word. There you go. It's the mirror image and comes out backwards. So he said, It is not worth anything to me. Now, that is what the Arizal says in pre Eitz Chaim. I'm going to explain all this soon. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, that's what he says in the book called pre Eitz Chaim the fruit of the tree of life, in which he describes the various festivals and says what they're all about according to Kabbalah. However, in the various uh, Sidurim prayer books where these permutations are brought and where the names of the month and the associations and the, um, and the senses of the month are brought about, um, 
we see something very strange. What do we see? We see that the verse that's used to depict the name is this one, and the letters are in a different order. The letters are hey, hey, yud, vav, which is, seems to be a contradiction. Before we said that the order of the letters is hey, vav, hey, yud. Now we're saying that's hey, hey, yud, vav. Why this contradiction? When we understand why this contradiction, we will understand something extremely fundamental about the festival of Purim, which happens in this month, Purim, and why it is such a month of laughter and joy. So, that is what we have to figure out now. Okay, um, now why don't I see myself on the screen? <laughs> All right, I become invisible for a minute there. All right, good. So, let's understand what actually happened. The central person in the story, besides Mordechai, but the central person in the story of Purim was, who was the central figure? Ladies, you should know. Esther, right? Esther, right. Esther was the central figure. She was, she was it. Oh, you have it there. Dennis wrote it in Esther. Now, what happened with, uh, with, with Esther? Esther realized she was actually had been brought into the palace as the wife of Ahasuerus. She was, she did not do this willingly. Um, she was kind of forced into a beauty competition uh, after Ahasuerus uh, got rid of his previous wife in a rather unpleasant way. Um, whose name was Vashti, he got rid of her and uh, he needed a new wife. So he made a, a beauty pageant, a beauty competition and um, Miss Universe, I guess you could say, of that time was Esther. Uh, she was kind of an unwilling participant in this whole thing, but she nevertheless became his wife. Esther was the niece of Mordechai. And according to some... Um, authoritative sources, she was actually married to Mordechai at the time and had to divorce him in order to uh, be able to be with uh, Hashverosh, the emperor, the emperor of Persia at that time. In any event, Esther was the central figure that caused a change in the permutations of the divine name. We've spoken about this before in previous classes. It, it's worth repeating, in my opinion. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to share screen again, and I will show you what I mean. Uh, let's just get that up there. Okay. By the way, the meaning of this verse, the meaning of this verse is, it's a verse about Judah. And it says about him that he will bind his donkey to the vine and the child of the donkey to uh, the branch of the vine. Now, this is a blessing that Jacob gave, uh, gave Judah, gave Yehuda, that Yaakov gave Yehuda, and it's talking about that the um, the donkey, which in Hebrew is usually called a chamor, a chamor, a chamor is a donkey. So the chamor will be bound to the vine, the grapevine, and the child of the donkey will also be bound to the child of the, the a sprig from the grapevine. Now, what does this mean? One of the explanations is that 
the donkey represents our physical being. The word chamor, uh, I'm just going to write it in Hebrew, chamor is the same as the word, same letters as the word chomer. For those of you who are new to the class, we don't usually do this kind of complicated stuff, but it's just interesting this time around, and uh, you'll soon see why. So the word chamor, donkey, is related to the concept of material being. It's the same letters, but in a slightly different permutation. So what they're saying, what this verse is saying is, the blessing of Yehuda, of Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, is that his donkey, which is called here, it's called an ayar, it's the same as, uh, but his donkey, it's, it's just a different uh, biblical word for the same thing. His donkey is bound to the grapevine. The grapevine represents the secrets of the Torah. Wine is called the, uh, is, a, uh, is a symbol of the secrets of the Torah, as we learn in the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, um, which starts like this, Shira Shirim Asheli Shlomo, this is the Song of Songs written by King Solomon, Shlomo. And then it goes on to say, Yeshakeni uh, Mishikos Pihu, May he bless me, may, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his kisses are sweeter than wine. Right? And the commentaries over there say that wine means the secrets of Torah. May God kiss me with, may God kiss me with that which is sweeter than wine. What's sweeter than wine? So again, there's explanation the Zohar says, it's not, we're not making a comparison over here. We're saying the sweetness that comes from wine. The sweetness, sweet is your love from wine that, that comes out of the wine. In other words, that comes out of the secrets of Torah. When a person studies deeply the secrets of, the secrets of Torah, that brings him to a certain level of love of the Creator that is sweeter than the... Uh, that, 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 that's a sweetness that comes from studying the inner dimensions, the inner depths of the Torah. In other words, Kabbalah. So that's what that second verse means. Now, why is this important? I was going to explain to you the idea of permutations. The first time we find out about the permutations of, uh, of letters is in the word, which I mentioned uh, before, um, the word Tsohar. Tsohar ta'ase teva. This was an instruction to Noah to make a window for the ark. Sohar. Now, um, the Baal Shem Tov, the famous Baal Shem Tov, the master and the founder of Hasidic uh, teachings, explains that the word Sohar, a window, is what, if this is an instruction, when Noah was told, make a window for the ark, subliminally and a subliminal meaning of the same verse the, the verse it saw table make a window for the ark the subliminal the, the inner dimensional meaning of it um, the inner dimensional meaning I'll come back to you in a second then the inner dimensional meaning of it is make a window for the word. Make a window for the word, meaning make the word filled with light. Make your words filled with light. Which word? Says the Baal Shem Tov, the very same word. This very same word, Sohar, also means, it also, in a different permutation, it would be the word Tzara. Sarah, these dashes between the letters just to separate them. They're not that on occur in the original. Sarah, the word Sarah means anguish, a time of trouble. As in the verse, Yaakov. It is a time of trouble for Jacob, for uh, the Israelites, for the Jewish people who descended from Jacob. 
Umimena Yevashayan, from it I will be saved. From it, from what's in it, from the, the, the tsara itself, the anguish, the difficulties, the problems themselves can become the solutions. The darkness can become the light. How does that happen? By changing the permutation. When the permutation is a negative permutation, it can change to a positive permutation. One can change it to a positive permutation. How do we do that? How do we change that? So there are intermediate steps the Baal Shem Tov explains. Tzara is the word also, these are all the, 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 meaning of the, the meaningful permutations of the word. Harat, someone who runs to do, when this letter comes at the end of a word, it becomes a slightly different form. Uh, harat, to do what God wrote. Same letters again. One who runs to do what it is that God wants is able to change Tsara into Tsohar. He's able to change anguish and, uh, and, and uh, pain and suffering into a source of light. Someone who runs with alacrity and energy to do what it is that God wants from him is able to change darkness into light, anguish into joy. That's exactly what um, Esther was able to do. And I'll explain how in a minute. And this will answer a question that Yael asked me uh, today. I hope it will answer it. Uh, but uh, just uh, briefly, a um, uh, question from Dennis. If the grape prior and vine represents the Torah, would the crushing of the grape grapes, the grapes bring the light of all people who read the Torah? Yes comes to the deeper, deeper relationship with the Creator, yes, that's the idea. The grapes themselves are not yet wine. The grapes have to be made into wine. The first state, uh, the first process in that is crushing the grapes. In other words, making them more accessible, breaking them down into smaller components, making it more accessible, and then it's allowed to sit and to ferment and to mature, and then it becomes an inner wisdom, which is the inner teachings of the Torah, wine. Of course, one cannot drink too much of them because then you become drunk. One has to associate it as well with, uh, with the food aspect of the Torah. In other words, that which normally nourishes and sustains a person in this world. Uh, you can't only feast on, um, on, on wine, obviously. But anyway, that is the intention, yes. Uh, now... To get back to uh, to get back now to uh, to Esther and what it was that she did. What did Esther do in order to change this whole situation? So what she did was she took it into her she took responsibility for bringing down evil for humbling evil, for uh, subjugating the evil of Haman. She took the responsibility for it. How it all came about uh, is not so much the place to, uh, to explain it over here, but um, basically the idea is that by saying, I am going to be the person responsible for changing this terrible decree that Haman had promulgated to destroy the Jewish people by taking upon herself to do something about it, she was able to change the permutation from the negative permutation which we first came across, the first negative permutation, to a positive permutation. In other words, what did she do? Again, I'm going to have to share screen. Sorry about this, folks. Um... Uh, just one second here. Yeah. By taking it upon herself, she was able to... Oh, I didn't share the screen, did I? There we go. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of uh, switching around backwards and forwards tonight. Okay. So... Um, when he said, it's worth nothing to me, when Haman said, it is worth nothing to me, which makes the permutation, the original permutation, 
which is the mirror reflection of the way it should be. It's 180 degrees from the way it should be. When Haman said that is not worth anything to me, and therefore I have to destroy everybody, all of the Jewish people, including Mordechai, when she did what she did, when she took upon herself the responsibility of changing things over, then it uh, it, it changed over the uh, it, uh, it it changed the permutation from a negative permutation, as we see from the earlier verse. All of this is worth nothing to me while they are still around, referring to Mordechai and the Jewish people. In other words, it'll only be worth it to me. All this honor and glory that I'm receiving will only be worth something when they're not around, when I've gotten rid of them. She changed it by taking upon herself the responsibility and what comes out of the, uh, the, 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 the idea was, what comes out of the, uh, the work that she did was that this is, this is now a very positive message. The second verse expresses a positive message and not a negative message. In other words, it is the changing over it is the changing, the permutation from the negative to the positive as we saw before. That is why the Megillah calls this whole month the month of Nahafohu. The tables are turned because it was eventually Haman that was hanged by Ahasuerus for his um, misdeeds uh, without going into them right now. But he was eventually strung up on a, uh, a gallows that he'd built for the same gallows that he'd built for Mordechai, 50 cubits high. He and his sons were all strung up by a Hashverosh on that gallows. Therefore, it's called a month of Nahafohu. It's an upside, the tables are turned. It's an upside down month. The month is upside down in the sense that the permutation is changed from negative to positive. Negative permutation to positive permutation. But again, this was all through the uh, actions, the selfless, the altruistic actions of Esther, because she could have said to herself, as Mordechai, Mordechai her uncle, pointed out to her, you could say, I will, I'm, I'm safe, I'm in the palace. It doesn't matter if your people are, if my people are destroyed, uh, the rest of the Jewish people are destroyed. I'll be safe, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to look after myself, and I'll, I'll be fine. No, she took it, she took the role of leadership and, uh, in a sense, the role of savior upon herself, that she would be the one who came to save the Jewish people in her era. In an earlier Era, it was Moses that came to save the Jewish people from destruction in Egypt. Later on, at this time, after the destruction of the first temple, it was Esther who um, it was Esther who came to save the Jewish people. It's true that she was together, she was together, she was together with Mordechai. In other words, Mordechai was instructing her and directing her and helping her, helping her solve uh, things, work things out. But she was the one that was in a position to do something about it, and she did. And that essentially is how this this month, this the, the, which is which is coming in uh, next week is related directly to the whole concept of Purim and why it has two permutations. Um, some of the first permutation, the negative permutation, was changed by Esther into a positive permutation. It now becomes a positive permutation. And the negative permutation is now the permutation of a different month, the month of Tammuz, which we won't go into now, but, um, uh, but in any event, that's the way it is. So, says uh, uh, various Hasidic uh, works explaining um, the teachings of the Arizal and explaining this whole concept. They uh, point out that the way to transform negative into positive 
is to open up a window, open up a little bit of light into the situation. In other words, if the, neg if the situation seems to be a completely negative situation, by understanding that the negativity of the situation is only in a state of Esther, Esther meaning Hester, Hester is hiddenness, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, on Purim we read what's called Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, which is the whole story of Purim. But the word Megillat Esther uh, means, comes really from, related to two words, Megillah meaning to Megale, to reveal Esther from the hiddenness. In other words, when, when godliness is hidden, the thing that has to be done is to reveal the godliness within, from within its hidden state. When there's a state of sorrow, when there's a state of anguish, a state of trouble, a state of difficulty, darkness, The thing to do is to open up that window to bring in to bring in a little bit of light, i.e., by using what we said before, by using the grapevine, by using the inner dimension, the inner secrets of Torah, in which there is no negative um, idea. The ideas of the inner dimension of Torah are all positive. They don't produce. Um, they don't produce punishments per se, they don't produce harshness, negativity, they're there to produce positivity, the, the, the idea of light. So, the concept of this month, therefore, is a month of laughter, because what is laughter? Uh, when do we laugh? We laugh about something when the... Um, when the, the punchline is the opposite of the way we thought things were going to go. We thought things were going in a certain direction, and now comes the punchline and tells us that that's actually not the direction at all. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, it's an example which I may have used, so some of you are familiar with the joke, just, <laughs> just uh, bear with me for a minute. Um, there, is, uh, there was a story about um, um, two families that had daughters of marriageable age, and there was no one in the little village who was uh, appropriate for them, so they wrote to um, the rabbi in the next town who had many students who were mar marriageable age, male students of mar mar marriageable age, and he asked them to, um, um, he asked uh, they, each of the families independently, one independently of the other, didn't even know about each other, each wrote a letter to the rabbi, to this rabbi, asking for, uh, you know, to, to, to suggest a young man who might be appropriate for the daughters and, uh, and so on. So um, this was in the days before um, uh, Match.com, you understand? So um, that's, what, uh, that's what happened. They sent off these letters. He gets the letters and uh, he goes around to his, uh, in his academy and he asks the students uh, who's uh, interested in getting married. So only one of them was interested. So he said to him, well, get on the train and go to such and such a little town, and uh, I'll write back to the uh, families that they should meet you at the station, and uh, they'll decide between them, um, uh, you know, whose daughter you're uh, appropriate for. So... Off they went to this. Uh, off he went to the station, and the the, the the letters were mailed out. He went to the station, and uh, two families are waiting at the station for this uh, young man to get out of the train. Um, neither of them, of them was really aware of the other family yet. Uh, so as soon as the student steps off the train and he's like looking around, they understand both of them understand this is the this is the boy. And both of them grab hold of him and say, uh, you're our new son-in-law. <laughs> That's how they used to do things in those days, I guess. huh? So, um, you're uh, our new prospective son-in-law. So, the other one, what do you mean? He's your son. He's my son-in-law. Uh, they start arguing. The two families start arguing. Well, what do you do when you have an argument? You go to the rabbi and you try and uh, work things out. So, they went to, uh, to the rabbi who was a very wise old man. And he said, we have a precedent. We have a precedent in the story of Solomon and the woman whose baby died. And there was one baby left. There were two women who were living together. And each one had a baby and one of the babies died. And uh, each claimed the living baby is theirs. 
So they went to King Solomon, and Solomon told them, Shlomo HaMelech told them, uh, well, in such a case, there's a, a Talmudic discussion. What do you do when there's an argument about possession of an object? You divide it in half. So you each have half. Bring me a sword. And of course, the one of the women was absolutely horrified, and she said, no, 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 you can't cut it in half. Uh, and the other one said, yeah, cut it in half. That's fair. So Solomon understood that the true mother was the one who said, don't cut it in half. It was her baby, obviously. All right, back to our story of the uh, young man who's now standing in front of the rabbi. The rabbi says, we have this president from Solomon, so bring me a sword, and we'll cut the boy in half. So um, we'll cut the young man in half. Each of you will get a half. So one of the mothers said, no, 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 you can't do that. God forbid, you can't cut him in half. And the other one said, yeah, cut him in half. That's fair. So I said, ah, that's the mother-in-law. So <laughs> I'm sorry to all mother-in-laws out here. It's only a joke to explain to you how you don't know what the punch it's, it's a It's coming from a, uh, a different angle, coming from a different direction. Yeah, the mother-in-law is the one that wanted to cut them up. Yeah, okay, got it. <laughs> all right, very good. But that's the, that, that's the month of Purim. The month of, it's not a true story. It's obviously just a joke. Um, the, uh, the month of Purim is one, why is it called the month of laughter? Because it's the month where the unexpected happens, where things get turned around, the tables are turned, things are upside down, nah for who, it's all upside down. But it's upside down in a positive way. What was a negative permutation is now a positive permutation. There are those that say that the laughter is not a result of that, the laughter is a cause of that. Yeah, the laughter is a cause of that. The laughter, in other words, the ability to laugh in a situation which is essentially a very, very negative situation, the ability to laugh in such a situation is really um, what causes the situation to change. And in fact, we see there's many stories about the Baal Shem Tov that we, that we actually uh, see that, um, that teaching on display. Many stories um, where in a very negative situation, the Baal Shem Tov just laughed and that changed the whole dynamic, it changed the whole thing. You will find too that yes, it's hard to, it's, it, it is hard to, um, uh, to, hard to fake a laugh, but one can laugh at the sort of hopelessness of the situation, and that might even, uh, you know, might change it completely. Laughter is a, is a way to change things. It's not only a result of things being changed, but it's a way to change things. Uh, so, uh, Andrea asks why people get drunk on Purim. Uh, one of the reasons is so that the rational mind won't interfere. <laughs> That's really it. The rational mind won't interfere with, um, now, you don't have to get drunk. It's just, uh, it's, it's a custom. And rip-roaring drunk is not necessary. You get a little bit drunk, it's fine. Uh, but just, uh, you know, when you get drunk, you kind of get um, um, beyond the, the controls that thoughts put on things. And sometimes you can come to a higher level of, uh, of, of understanding. Now, that doesn't mean that anyone should get rip-roaring drunk. Um, yeah, laugh therapy, there you go, exactly, laugh therapy. There is, in fact, a, a whole school of laugh therapy that was started by a psychiatrist in India, actually, that he has what he calls laughing schools and laughing workshops. And um, he gets people to come by, and they practice laughing. And this for him, this, that, that's now the only therapy that he does. He doesn't do any other psychiatry. He just does laugh therapy. And even though uh, a person is not um, necessarily uh, laughing uh, hysterically and laughing uh, really out loud, but forcing yourself to laugh in some ways actually does, um, does have an effect. There is um, there's a certain smile which is called, there's, there's a smile with the lips, and then there's a thing called a Duchenne smile or Duchenne smile, maybe. Um, you can look it up, D-U-C-H-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, smile. The difference between a regular smile and a Duchenne smile is that a Duchenne smile is really coming from within you. 
and you can see that it's a real smile because it causes the muscles around the eyes to also contract and, you know, make sort of crow's feet at the edges of the eyes. Now, with a, with a regular smile, that's not going to happen. But with a real smile, it does. So what they do, part of his, uh, this, this Indian doctor, part of what he does is, uh, when I say an Indian doctor, I mean a doctor from India, the country of India. <clears throat> um, so part of what he does is he teaches people to make this Duchenne smile. To, and they've done studies on it and actually done studies of the chemicals in the body. And they found that when a person, even if he fakes a Duchenne smile, but sort of does it, forces his face into it, it releases certain chemicals and hormones into the bloodstream, which are calming and uplifting. They actually change the mood. So, uh, yes, laugh therapy has been uh, known to cure illness, that's for sure. Um, and there you go. By encouraging laughter, yeah. But a book Anatomy of an Illness as Perceived by the Patient. Excellent. Oh, that is really interesting. I'm going to look at that. Um, let me copy and paste that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think I'm going to try and get that. Sounds fascinating. Okay, folks, that is the... Um, that is the class for tonight. Um, any questions? And Esther brought this all about, by the way. Again, it was Esther that brought this about. <laughs>